Hi and welcome to another Ask GBN Tech. You know the drill. There's the, uh, there's the details right there. Get involved, hashtag and all that stuff. Right, first question is from Andy Sherm. Andy Sherm. Andy Sherm. Not like Shermanator Sherm, is it? Strange name. Uh, I've taken out the top out, uh, top out rubbers on my RockShox Pike as I read this could improve sensitivity. Will the top out knock, um, knock damage the forks at all? Uh, well, it shouldn't damage and it shouldn't be topping out. The whole point of this um, essentially is to make the negative air spring slightly bigger so your fork is a bit more supple off the top. If yours is knocking, then it's not done correctly and yes, it could damage stuff. But the only issue with removing it, other than the fact you'll probably invalidate your warranty in doing so, um, I don't know what the RockShox line is on doing that. But the only thing is when you're increasing the negative chamber on a fork that's not designed for it originally, is the fork might start creeping back down over time, in which case you need to just do an air spring service from time to time. Now I've got an ancient 36 Fox 36 somewhere, uh, a pre-boost one, that was taken up to 180 mil travel for me by Chris Porter um, from Mojo Suspension. Now, he basically did some wizardry on the inside of this and gave me a giant negative air spring on it. In fact, I think the fork only really had a 160 mil travel, but it was set at 100, 180 mil height with this insane amount of negative spring space on it. I've never felt anything, even to this date, that was that good, but it did need constant work on the air spring to keep it like that. But for how well it worked, and I was quite happy to you know, pull the insides out and give it a bit of grease, put it back in again, it felt unreal. Um, so that is a good hack to do on your forks, but if there's a metal to metal clunk, it's not quite right. So uh, perhaps you wanna have a look at that one, Andy. Um, good luck with that. Next up is from Mostly Pictures of the Cat. In theory, could someone suitably skilled in metal fabrication amend an old frame to give it more modern geometry? Oh, that's an idea for a video. This could be a great video where you team up with a welder and modernize a retro bike. Uh, yeah, well, firstly, it depends on the frame. With steel, yeah, almost certainly you could do this. You could grow a bike, you could slacken the head angle off a bit. Yeah. Yeah, there's something there in that, isn't there? Um, you probably couldn't do it with alloy, or not all alloys, some alloys are air hardened, some are heat treated. If it's heat treated by re-welding with it, you're gonna affect the heat treating and arguably, I guess you can make it a bit weaker. Um, so you probably couldn't do it with all of those. Although that said, uh, there was a downhill racer, well, it still is a downhill racer called Ben Reed, an uh, Irish guy. Him and his dad used to, well, Ben rode, rode for giant bikes and they used to cut and shut the bike to get them the way they wanted to. Um, they, as far as I know, used to take bits out of the chainstay and shorten the back end of the bike to get it to ride the way Ben liked. And man, he could ride that thing. Uh, he was so in tune with what they wanted to do, but that was an alloy bike, 6061 possibly. Um, and they used to literally just chop a chunk out and re-weld it. And that worked great for him. Couldn't recommend if that was a good thing to do or not. And um, I can't imagine his sponsors liked it. I've got a feeling they kicked off about that, but uh, hey, he rode really fast. So kind of double edged sword there, isn't it? Um, so I've written down here, brakes not enough. I've got two fairly similar questions here, so uh, we'll tackle them together. So the first one's from Antoine, and it says, Doddy, I've got an XT hardtail with a 180 rotor at the front, 160 at the rear, uh, XT two piston calipers. I'm happy with how it brakes, but on long alpine descents, they overheat and the braking power fades. Uh, how's best to tackle this? And the other one is from uh, 2112 Remy. I've got SLX M7000 brake on the front of my Pace Hardtail, which feels good, but a brake on the rear feels underpowered and fades on descents. I'm around 95 kilos, so it might be why. Uh, would going up to bigger rotors and stuff. Right, so um, I've had similar issues. Okay, so I'm 90 odd kilos in that sort of realm. So I'll answer both these questions at once. Right, so with, re with regards to the brake caliper, setup, so you can have two piston and four piston. Four piston caliper, yes, it's gonna have loads more power and it's also gonna deal with getting hot much better. Bigger rotors, yes, you can get loads more power, but if you're running bigger rotors on a two piston setup, the whole setup can get hotter, which of course translates as fading. Yeah, and then again, think about a cross country bike here. So on a cross country bike where it's much easier to lock up the wheels, you don't actually want too much power. So yes, you can arguably go for bigger rotors to get a little bit more power, but you're like what you're finding here, your brakes are fading slightly. So maybe the better option is to not opt for bigger rotors as such on a cross country bike, but maybe even look at getting a four piston front rotor, uh, front caliper even. So I've done this on a nuke proof reactor ST that I've got. Um, I kept the rotor size, they're 180 front and rear, and it came with two piston brakes front and rear, and I've just upgraded the front caliper to a four piston just to give myself, you know, when you're really loading up the bike uh, to really scrub some speed off, you know, the front brake does a lot of that. I know it depends on how you ride and the terrain you're riding on, because some people drag that rear brake. Um, 
it's obviously not going to help you if it's going to be fading. But bear in mind that a more powerful brake on a cross-country bike is just going to lock the wheels up constantly, so that's not going to slow you down that much. Um, sintered pads, of course, they're going to make a big difference because they deal with the heat much better. Of course, they're not going to be quite as good when they're not up to heat. So on a cross-country bike for most terrain where you're not riding it as aggressively on longer descents, isn't, they're not actually going to be quite as efficient and as good as using a resin pad. But sintered pads on a bike that's overheating is going to cope with it much better. Finned pads are going to help. Finned rotors or rotors that are in a two-piece design maybe with an alloy spider and a steel braking track. They're quite good because they pull a bit more heat away from there. Um, so yeah, there are a few different ways you can go about this, but I've gone for 180 front and rear on my trail bike with a four piston front, two piston rear. And on my cross country bike, I've got 140, 160, yeah, 140, 160 on there. And to be fair, I do have the same problem as you um, on two or three places I've been riding, but given the fact it was such a minimal amount, I'm all right with that, because otherwise I'll be locking up the brakes everywhere, so it doesn't suit me to run any bigger. But I could arguably go up to 160, 180, uh, and that would give me a little bit more power on there, and that would work a bit better without phasing the calipers too much. Next up though would be to go to a four piston caliper. Um, yeah, it's a tricky thing when you're just trying to eke out a bit more power from the system without phasing that system too much. But just think, you know, if you're putting too much power through the system that can't cope with the heat, it's obviously going to translate as brake fade, uh, and you know what that means. So uh, good luck to both of you. Hopefully uh, there's some ideas around doing that stuff. There's lots of things you can do, but some of it's quite expensive if you want to change caliper. Okay, next up, is it necessary to grease sealed bearings in hubs, and how to know when it's time to replace them? Well, generally, no. If it's time to replace the bearings, you'll know because they're either going to be seized up or they're going to be all notchy and not working very well. And if it's in a rear hub, by the time that's happened, they're going to be knackered. So just putting some fresh grease in those bearing races isn't going to do a thing. However, you can be you can have a bit of a preemptive strike on those bearings by doing more regular maintenance, get in there before things get knackered, and then by all means clean things up, um, degrease things. Be careful if you're degreasing the bearings, and you know you don't want grease to go in there as such, unless you're going to replace that grease. So at this stage, if they're feeling smooth, there's nothing wrong with adding some grease in there to sort of prolong that and basically put a barrier to stop grit and mud and moisture and stuff getting in there. Um, but yeah, think of maintenance as a preemptive strike. Uh, don't do it when it needs to be done because it's too late. Uh, kind of like a drinking water in the desert. You know, you need to be doing it the whole time, not just when you're thirsty. Otherwise, you are uh, up a creek without a paddle. Uh, next one. Oh, so this is in relation to a picture I posted, uh, this picture of my cross-country bike with a share in the cockpit with a garment on there. And they say, what garment mount is that in the third picture? Um, I've got the mountain bike mount, MTB out front mount, but that looks way more tidy. It's actually just a standard mount. So in the box with any Garmin comes a standard mount with some O-rings and that's all it is. It's the best option I found actually on my cross country bike. So I can get it on the stem in line, looks super neat and tidy. Uh, it doesn't move and it's no frills, but of course it doesn't fit all bikes. Um, you know, shorter stems, you're not gonna be able to get it in position. You will need those brackets like the one you've got. Now, there are some other options you can have a look at. See if I've got one in here. There we go. So this one is a, in fact, <laughs> that's not the whole thing. I've got a top cap one here. So this replaces a top cap on your stem, basically. So if you've got a bike with modern geometry, it's a nice long front end, um, you know, a nice long reach on there, you might be able to put your Garmin on your top cap. That's a super neat way of doing it. That's literally a top preload cap. So that bit does a preloading and then you screw this into the top of that. It's like a little insert and that is what your Garmin can connect to. That is a super neat way of doing it. Um, and of course, there's the official Garmin mounts. So the official Garmin mounts work really well. Um, but yeah, I like the, the free one that comes with the computer because it does the best job, if I'm completely honest. Okay, here's an interesting question from FNH Design. With the recent big changes in geometry over the past five years, how do you think design will change in the next five to 10 years? Do you expect it to slow down in dramatic changes and become more refined in the elements companies have, or the opposite? Do you know what, that's a really good question. There's a, there's a lot to that as well. Um, I'd imagine the manufacturers will probably do a bit more size-specific geometry. Um, now we've kind of got the arms war of longer, lower slacker out of the way, and everyone's kind of settling on the fact that, generally speaking, longer bikes um, can be a better thing. Of course, cross-country doesn't really apply. Um, 
So I would like to see, um, this is from my perspective, I'd like to see size-specific geometry, you know, longer chain stays, more, more proportional chain stay length on bigger and smaller bikes to reflect the length of the front centre there. Um, I would like to see wider handlebars on, on actually on all bikes and then the handlebars you trim them down to length rather than trying to size specific something that's a personal preference option on there. Um, bigger travel single crown bikes. I think uh, 150, 150mm, well, I'm saying this because there's a bike just to my side which is top secret that was delivered to me the other day. Um, and this bike is a bruiser, so it's got a Fox 38 on the front, it's got a, a float, it's got a DHX2 on the rear, it's a serious piece of kit. So this bike's basically a 180mm travel bike. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb and say anything from 150 upwards is going to be really heavily geared towards all-out speed through rocks and stuff, whereas stuff less than that is going to be more around pedaling efficiency. Now you're starting to see things like um, more high pivot designs and things like that creeping in, idler wheels, that sort of stuff. Now let's face it, that's not going to be for the cross country mile munchers, that's going to be for the rider that wants the most out of suspension performance. So I think you're going to see bigger travel bikes having more of a focus on how well that suspension works. So refinement, I guess, is what I'm trying to say there. Um, I'd like to see more things like additive manufacturing or cold fusion metal. Um, cold metal fusion, whatever you want to call it, you know, it's uh, 3D printing with titanium, stuff like that. I'd like to see more design processes used that have less waste. One of the things I've loved about the Atherton Bright project is when they make their um, all of the lugs basically at once, there's barely any waste. It's, it's an amazing system to use. It's really quite cool. Um, and I guess with that, recyclable carbon. Come on, people. Come on. The technology is there to do it. We see it in the aerospace industry. Uh, recyclable carbon would be really, really good. I know that some brands already offer this and it is possible, but it's not possible across the board yet. So I think that's got to come. Everyone's going to be going a bit greener with their design, surely. They have to. Um, further development of electronic stuff. Shimano haven't responded to uh, what SRAM have done in recent years. Obviously, Shimano gave us DI2 revolution with electronic gears. SRAM responded with wireless electronic gears, which is just absolutely incredible. It's witchcraft. So what is Shimano going to do? No one's looking at you, Shimano, are they? Um, and gearbox designs. Surely they are going to start becoming more popular. We've had the rear derailleur since the beginning of time with the traditional chain. And yes, arguably, it's still such a good system because even the fact it's all exposed, um, prone to being hit on the bike, it's still the least friction system. Um, very efficient, cost effective to produce as well. But gearboxes, come on. It's got to be the gearbox, hasn't it? I think of all of those things, uh, as well as going green, the gearbox, I think. So um, snap to it, all those uh, manufacturers out there. Okay, now uh, the next one looks more like a proposal for a video that I need to make, um, of which I'm already dreading looking at it. It's from Sam uh, Eth1. Full suspension bike with solid seat post or modern geometry rigid mount bike with a dropper. Um, I'm pretty sure I've said a few times in videos, you know, I reckon I'd be quicker on a rigid bike with a dropper post than I would be on a full suspension bike with a rigid post. Gonna have to try it, aren't I? Um, I I'm not even gonna second guess this. I'm gonna make that video. Next question. MTB Saloon. I've tuned a few rear derailleurs that work great on the low gears on the cassette and also the high gears on the cassette, but for some reason are not lined up correctly in the two middle gears. I can't figure out what would cause this. Would love to hear how to troubleshoot this problem. Thanks. Okay, well, there's a few things. So the first thing to check is if the derailleur is tight on the frame. Sounds daft, but that was sometimes a four, sometimes a five, sometimes a Torx T25 that attaches the mech to the hanger bolt. Sometimes it can unwind, unwind slightly. Even like a quarter of a turn is enough to put your gears out slightly. And if that's happened and you've adjusted your limit screws to compensate, it'll be fine at either end, but in the middle it won't be quite right. So I've had that before where that's been probably about three gears up the block uh, where it's been doing that. Sometimes uh, if the cable is sticky inside the housing, you can compensate with stuff. It doesn't always drop back down correctly into the smaller size sprockets at the rear, so perhaps you might undo your limit screw, which in theory would make it over drop, but in order to get it to drop down, and then of course you mess up the gears. Um, I don't know, but my biggest suspect is the uh, the mech being loose. Um, your B-screw as well, by the way, can affect things. So if there's too much tension on the B-screw, sometimes it doesn't drop back down correctly. Um, 
Don't know. That's a tricky one. There's, there's lots of things it can be, but the biggest culprit, if it's working at both ends nicely, will be if the mech is very slightly loose. So check all the hardware on there. Check the mech is onto the frame properly. Check your rear skewer or axle or maxle or whatever system it is. That is all tight and correct. And the mech hanger, basically, that the mech bolts into is secure on the frame. Sometimes they're part of the rear axle system. Sometimes they bolt independently onto the frame. So check all of those things because any amount of movement there completely buggers up the gears. Uh, well, there we go. There's the end of another weekly Ask GMBN Tech. Hopefully you learned something. Hopefully you answered some of your questions. Uh, give us some feedback as always, and we'll see you in the next video. See you later.